Uh, and I just want to ask, uh, I, I saw that it's reported. Um, uh, Brianne and, and, and Zizi, do you have something to share before we start the, the conversation? Okay, you are good? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ru Peng An. I am an associate professor here at the Brown School. And uh, I'm doing research mainly in the field of uh, obesity prevention, uh, dietary behavior, and physical activity. So uh, my work is heavily quantitatively oriented. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, quantitative modeling, uh, policy simulations, uh, for example, uh, econometrics, applied health sciences, uh, and uh, no cost benefit, cost effective analysis, uh, simulation, modeling, uh, and uh, thank you, Zizi, for sharing that. Uh, and also, uh, I'm uh, much into the field of uh, artificial intelligence. So today, uh, for this session, I want to talk about just very briefly uh, uh, in in a uh, larger picture uh, how uh, we we can apply artificial intelligence uh, in terms of uh, machine deep learning in health and social sciences. So although AI has been widely adopted in many disciplines, uh, in, in industry, as well as in academia, but most applications are uh, in uh, natural sciences, uh, in statistics, uh, with the engineering, uh, computer science for sure, uh, and maybe some tend to, to finance as well. Uh, but really, the applications in AI uh, in health and especially social sciences are just emerging. So uh, you know, my, my personal perspective, many others, we agree that definitely uh, we will see more and more applications of AI in those fields. And uh, it is critical for us to understand what we are expecting for uh, in the near future and also far into the future and how we can best prepare ourselves as uh, um, you know, uh, educators and public health practitioners and social workers, how we can be best prepared uh, for the, uh, the digital age uh, really dominated by artificial intelligence. So that is the, uh, the reason why I want to bring this talk uh, to you and hopefully uh, though the, the talk may inspire you in some ways and maybe uh, generate some interest and discussions uh, about AI. So AI won't be uh, won't have to be a buzzword, but also really something that you can grasp and you can talk about and you can learn in the future. And uh, so uh, Zizi and uh, Brianna are going to monitor the chat. So uh, in, in terms of the, the talking, I, I apologize. I can no, monitor the chat at the same time because I'm really not very multifunctional. Uh, so multitasking, uh, but then uh, I hopefully will have some time for uh, Q&A in case you have any uh, pressing questions, feel free to post on the chat or just uh, prepare to unmute yourself by the end of presentation. So we will have a discussion afterwards. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, can you see my presentation slides? Okay, good, great. Okay, so you now as we talked, the, uh, the, the today's title of the talk is Artificial Intelligence Applications in Health and Social Sciences. We are not going to focus on any particular application, but really providing you a larger picture about the landscaping of, of AI. So first, what is AI, right? In, in, in our mind, we have a lot of imaginations about AI. Maybe AI is the almighty know-all, uh, and AI might be the most sophisticated mind. Uh, for example, maybe Sherlock Holmes plus Albert Einstein uh, plus William Shakespeare. Uh, it's, it has a lot of really highly intelligent, uh, it can achieve superhuman, performance in all the complicated, sophisticated mathematics or literature or other uh, specific domains. And you know, some of you may think about, well, AI must be a math genius because it's, it seems to be complicated, a lot of math, a lot of statistics. So AI probably would be great uh, in solving those uh, math or statistical problems. So such as this crazy equation, right? For human being, well, it may take years for for us to solve, probably for AI, it's going to be a piece of cake. 
So no, no, our, our real imagination can go wild regarding what is AI, right? Uh, and then, well, uh, there are many different definitions for AI, but I particularly like uh, Dr. Collett's, uh, who is uh, a really a pioneer in artificial intelligence applications. And uh, his definition uh, in his uh, really landmark textbook talk about AI is the effort to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by humans. So here, interestingly enough, no AI is not a almighty giant. Right, it's not a you know, a, 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 a mathematical genius or something like that. But really, AI is trying to do the tasks that we human doings are doing all the time. For us, it's very natural, uh, very easy task. But for AI, actually, it's pretty challenging. It take scientists years to develop algorithm that finally can achieve uh, possibly a near human performance in doing some of the really routine tasks. So let's see what those tasks are. Uh, so basically AI are doing, uh, we are trying to use AI to do some really basic cognitive functions. Uh, for example, visual spatial ability, right? Trying to you know, give you directions uh, 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 in the geospace, uh, maybe you know, uh, uh, classifying images into different types. So you know, we, we as human beings acquired those abilities when we were probably baby, right? Since so it's natural to us, but actually it's very hard for machine to learn that. And language comprehensive speech, right? So um, you know, uh, for human being, we, we all have our mother tongue, right? Uh, and and you know, we, 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 we may pick up a second or third language and it's very natural to us. Uh, and it's easy for us to communicate via language, of course, not uh, in terms of equations, right? And mathematical symbols. But actually it turns out to be pretty hard problem for machine to learn. And maybe ability to learn new information, right? For example, no, uh, when we were child, we were taught, well, you have to stay off the fire, uh, be, be careful not to be burned, right? And if you see a fire, you no, know, put water on top and not, uh, not put oil, right? Uh, so we learned this at, at a really little age. Um, but then how we can truly really teach machines to learn those uh, abilities and the memory, right? We all have our great memories, uh, some best memories, some, some uh, you know, sorrow memories, uh, but then you no, know, uh, but for machine, you know, what kind of memory we are talking about? How can machine acquire some of the memories like human beings? And not to say creativity, imagination, right? You write a novel, um, you develop uh, a, a new app, uh, you draw a new picture, uh, and you write a new essay or, or, or um, uh, no uh, analytic story. So uh, those creativity and imagination are embedded in the human beings, right? Because we we are uh, really uh, very very creative and very uh, imaginative. But well, in terms of uh, machine learning, how can machine learn machine learn those uh, those uh, you no know, basic uh, cognitive tasks? And um, so uh, the the Merovax paradox, uh, I think, put this very nicely. Uh, so uh, the 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 uh, the scientist said, you no, know, years ago, the hard problems are easy, and the easy problems are hard, right? So uh, for machine, machine has already been pretty good all the time to solve mathematical equations, giving you approximations based on mathematical uh, statistical properties, right? Uh, uh, no, 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 looking for patterns uh, embedded in multi-layer uh, uh, of data sets. But really, uh, no, in terms of the aforementioned cognitive tasks, machine are traditionally not good at them because those seems to be easy problem to human beings, but actually very hard problem for machines. Uh, and you no, know, nowadays we call AI as a general technology, it's just like electricity, right? Electricity is a general technology. It can be applied to you know, all different industries and sectors, right? It has embedded in uh, your life uh, to the extent that we don't really, uh, we take it for granted and we never question uh, and we only really fear uh, feel that the pain uh, when we, we, we lost electricity, right? Uh, 
And AI is like a general electricity, a general technology like electricity. So AI is now uh, has been everywhere. Uh, it is so broadly used that you hardly think about uh, actually you are interacting with AI uh, on a daily basis, right? I'll give you some examples. For example, uh, no, uh, how many times in a day, right? Not today in an hour, maybe in terms of minutes that you use the Google or Bing to search um, something, right? Um, and how many times you watch the YouTube or Netflix, right? Uh, for entertainment and, and for learning uh, opportunities. And how many times you, uh, you, you purchase something from uh, those uh, digital domains, uh, this, uh, for example, Amazon, and Shopify, um, uh, those, those big vendors, right? Uh, and how many times you, you interact with your friends using Facebook or Twitter? Uh, no, for even younger generation, probably you are using something different, WhatsApp uh, and, and Instagram and uh, TikTok, right? Uh, and uh, probably, you know, most of us would have some kind of variables, right? Digital variables, for example, Fitbit, Apple Watch, or, or you no know, something else, right? That may track your physical activity, tell you what to eat, what not to eat, uh, no matter your sleeping pattern, your vital uh, activity uh, uh, signals and, and giving you maybe uh, messages in real time. Uh, and uh, well, of course, no, almost everyone now have some kind of smartphone, right? Automatic phone system. Uh, and you no, know, uh, we probably sometimes uh, will need to ask uh, others uh, and we can just uh, maybe ask a chatbot uh, maybe Google Assistant, maybe um, uh, Alexa about the weather, about the uh, the, the the news uh, or something else, right? And also, well, uh, no, if you uh, uh, if you ever use electric banking, uh, online banking system, you know that uh, the banking system have been uh, really uh, revamped uh, using AI technology to, for example, in the fraud detection, in automating you know, uh, banking, uh, banking activities, and so on and so forth, right? So all of those daily activities involve AI, right? Uh, and AI is really the backbone for uh, probably more, you know, all of those uh, applications that we are interacting with on a daily basis. So that is how widely spread AI is. And well, uh, we are previously, well, probably two, two decades ago, we were, we were really afraid of uh, the so-called digital divide, right? So uh, basically defined as uh, people uh, who know about how to access internet using computer versus those who do not. And uh, we all know, well, uh, so people, uh, know who, who, who are really uh, exposed to this digital divide and uh, don't know how to access internet are significantly disadvantaged uh, compared to people who know about technology, right? So that was probably the, the discussion over the last 20 years. But now uh, I would argue, and many probably would agree with me that now we are really facing the next generation of divide, which is called the AI divide. So basically, uh, no, those people who know how to interact with AI and how to use AI for information retrieval, for automate tasks, uh, 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 for you no know, any of the, 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 the decision-making processes, they are definitely uh, much more advantaged than the other people who do not know AI, who uh, know that many doors would be shut down uh, because you know, people uh, uh, won't be able to uh, utilize and take advantage uh, of, of AI uh, for their daily activity, for their decision-making process, and so on and so forth. Okay? So uh, I would say probably in the next five to 10 years, we are going to see the AI divide to be more and more uh, significant uh, in the society. And then, well, uh, I, I know there's always some, some, some uh, confusions about AI, right? Uh, though the, the many times the hand news talk about AI as you know, uh, some kind of evil uh, taking away people's jobs uh, and you no know, creating biased uh, estimates that you know, uh, make uh, subpopulations more vulnerable or disadvantaged, right? Uh, 
and uh, usually we call it algorithmic biases. Um, and and uh, so we, we talk about, we, we see a lot of you know, uh, negative uh, consequences of, of using AI, right? And you no, know, besides, of course, you know, the, the, you know, uh, uh, the major advantage of AI as well. So here I want to use the analogies of a hammer. So you know, think about AI like a hammer is a tool. Right? There's no evil AI, and uh, nor the, 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 there is a good-hearted AI, right? That is not relevant because AI is just a tool, uh, it, just like a hammer, right? You can, you can use hammer to nail down a nail, and you can use hammer to knock someone's head, right? So you can't really argue, well, this is an evil hammer, and that is a good-hearted hammer, right? That doesn't, doesn't make sense. What makes sense is that you know, we need to consider AI is a is a, a tool just like a hammer, but it's a more so, so sophisticated tool. Uh, so you can make rules about you no know, using hammer. Uh, say you can make regulations to say you no know, someone have to use hammer to nail down nail. Anyone who use hammer to knock someone's head would be punished, right? Uh, but AI, well, for AI, you can make similar rules, but it's just more complicated, right? Because uh, AI is definitely uh, uh, millions uh, fold more complicated than the hammer. So you know, we're still trying to figure out what AI cannot do, right? Uh, so that is to say, you know, if you want to make any regulations uh, for the use of AI, it's going to take a long time. It's going to be a evolving, ever evolving process uh, because we are still exploring the limit of a potential AI applications, right? And well, there's another argument that AI is taking over the world, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, no, the, so when I was a kid, I know I, I was fascinated, really I watched this Terminator series again and again. Um, uh, and uh, so you no, know, many of us nowadays still believe that AI is going to take over the world someday, right? Somehow, just like what was predicted in the Terminator series. Right? Uh, but really, uh, it is something we need to concern about, you no, know, maybe in science fictions, uh, but to me, well, as a AI practitioner, uh, no, I don't have such worry. Uh, so uh, previously there was a, a, a famous uh, philosopher, um, this car uh, who talk about you no know, I uh, has a famous saying of I think therefore I am right uh, so now the, the, actually the AI is challenging that that convention uh, because AI can think right AI can learn but uh, that doesn't mean that AI uh, uh, knows the existence of itself uh, so basically we, we want to make a counter argument that intelligence is not equal to self awareness. Okay. So this is a critical, a critical uh, distinction uh, because, well, if you consider, um, you know, uh, if you, you're afraid of AI taking over the world, it has to have some purpose, right? For example, in the Terminator, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the intelligence, the, uh, the, how to say, digital intelligence, uh, suddenly know the awareness of the self and, and then try to benefit uh, its own population by destroying, uh, destroying this world, right? Um, but well, uh, the, the AI, at least nowadays, uh, the AI that we talk about, they are computer algorithms uh, that are trying just to maxim to minimizing the, the uh, human defined loss function. And that's it, no matter how many, how, how complicated the model is, is essentially doing the same, trying to minimize a mathematical function. Right, uh, so the AI uh, doesn't have common sense and AI doesn't have self-awareness. So if a machine has no self-awareness, how the machine would come up with the idea of trying to self-preserve by destroying uh, the human being, right? So at least for now, no, I, I, I don't take that, that argument very seriously. And then another argument is AI is taking away drugs, right? Uh, so no, I want to bring uh, analogies from uh, you no know, 200 years ago when uh, the Britain was under the Industrial Revolution, right? So if you we learn that that history, you know at that time uh, people for the first time know uh, knew how to use machines to create machines, right? The the steam engine, uh, the uh, the, uh, the 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 automotive loom were developed. Uh, so that it take away a lot of you no know, uh, labor intensive jobs, 
right? So you won't have to use humans in the loom because machine can do a much quicker job. And you don't need you no know, uh, animals to push the, the cart uh, because, well, the steam engine uh, can do a better job, right? Uh, but really at that time, uh, when we had the industrial revolution, were those machines would uh, no, no, those uh, no new technologies taken away jobs? Well, in uh, in the most immediate um, situation, it could. But to be more profound, actually, uh, it's, it didn't take away jobs. It created a lot more jobs uh, than it took away, because it's reallocate uh, the the labor market and redistribute the labors from those really hard, heavy, boring jobs uh, to those more creative uh, uh, jobs that do need more uh, human cognition rather than just hard labor, right? And similarly, you know, we, we see the AI. So uh, if you argue that AI really taking away jobs and replacing people, uh, and then let's, let's take a look of the data, right? Uh, in the last 10 years from 2010, we see a dramatic increase in Amazon to adopt AI, right? So uh, uh, Amazon is probably one of the, 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 the companies that adopt most of the AI applications um, over the past 10 years. And, and then look at the data showing the number of jobs uh, that Amazon was hiring over the last 10 years. It's not decreasing, it's not replacing people, actually is uh, the, 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 the number of people hired by Amazon increased exponentially over the last 10 years. Right? Um, so I would say, no, well, uh, to some extent, maybe the AI is taking away job of a particular kind, but well, uh, I, I would want really to bring your attention to the industrial revolution, so not to overlook uh, the new jobs that are created, uh, are going to create it uh, by, by AI. And then, well, you may ask the question, really, what is the difference between AI and, and you know, the previous technologies, right? For example, the automation. We talk about automation years ahead of AI, before AI was even invented, right? In the industrial revolution, we had we tried to automate things. But really, what is the what is the difference this time? How how is AI uh, uh, more uh, advanced or uh, desirable uh, or advantageous in comparison to those traditionally uh, uh, so called rule based algorithms? Uh, so the the fundamental uh, the fundamental difference is actually just illustrated here in this simple graph. So on on the uh, the, the 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 top. Uh, um, Part of the graph, we, we saw the rule-based algorithms, these traditional automation systems. Basically, you need to provide the rules and the data as input. And then you know, based on some classical programming, uh, the machine is going to produce answers. Right? So basically, the machine is going to use the rules that you had wrote uh, and the data to process the, the, uh, to process the data and then provide you the answer. And in AI, or we call machine learning, uh, modern AI machine learning, uh, we do not need to provide rules. We instead we provide data and answer. And machine learning is going to learn uh, from the the answer data pair to understand you know, how the data are related to the answer, and then it's going to produce the rules. Uh, so that is really the, the the fundamental difference. And which one is easier, right? I, I guess probably all of you could see that the machine learning approach is much much easier because writing rules, handwriting rules, can take years. Consider how many rules you want to write to understand human language. You no, know, you probably spend you no know, uh, two hundred years uh, and still couldn't figure it out because it's just too complicated. Uh, because we human use language so differently. Uh, for example, because I'm not a native language speaker, English speaker, so no, I, I may have a lot of you no know, uh, uh, grammatical mistakes uh, here. Uh, but 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 well, you no. Know, if you write write all this in the rules, well, it's just take forever, right? Uh, but machine doesn't need that. Machine learning uh, can learn, can adapt the data, and, and then. Um, by learning from the examples, the machines will come up with the rules that are very complicated, uh, but practically very useful. Uh, to just to nail this idea down, let's compare you know, how a traditional rule-based algorithm and AI are going to handle uh, a very simple uh, 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 task of filtering out uh, spam emails. 
right? So now nowadays, now all of us have Outlook that have uh, some some type of uh, 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 filters, right? Uh, mostly, actually, most of them are AI based uh, filters to fill automatically fill out spam emails. So for the rule-based system, in order to differentiate between uh, the spam email versus real email, uh, no, you as a programmer has to write all the rules. Maybe one rule is no any uh, email containing lottery, the, the name of lottery, or containing three um, uh, asterisk, uh, or containing uh, winning. Those words should be considered as uh, uh, as spam email, right? Uh, but well, things change, right? Maybe it, it works in the first you know, year and second year, there's new trending, right? And there's new phishing email that use different wording and you have to change your rules, right? And the rule can be arbitrarily complicated and also contradicting each other, right? But in machine learning, you don't need to do any of that. You just provide the machine with a number of emails that are spam emails and a number of emails that are real emails and you label them. You tell machine which one is a spam email, which one is not. And the machine is going to come up with, by treating the machine learning program, is going to tell, be able to learn from the data examples, and then uh, uh, come up with a model that can differentiate spam emails from the, the, uh, the real emails. Okay. So that is the, the fundamental difference between machine, and machine learning and rule-based modeling. And so, uh, no, uh, the, uh, in terms of the scope of artificial intelligence, you would consider artificial intelligence is an over-compassing, no, all-compassing, no, big idea concept. Uh, and it contains machine learning. And uh, so machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, uh, or we call it the modern uh, artificial intelligence. Okay? Uh, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Uh, so uh, the deep learning uh, basically uses uh, multi-layered um, uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, we, we, we call it layers. Uh, so basically a layer is just a set of uh, uh, neurons, uh, of course, artificial neurons, not the neurons in our brain, uh, to learn a complicated uh, abstract and highly nonlinear uh, relationship and patterns. Right? Uh, so you know, when we talk about AI, uh, modern AI, uh, we are really just talking about machine learning and deep learning. And uh, here are the differences between machine deep learning. So the machine learning often we call it shallow learning uh, on, and the most used in tablet data. Tablet data means that you have a number of rows and a number of columns, right? It's the most uh, common data set you've seen. Uh, for example, if you use the, you know, uh, uh, say digital, uh, uh, maybe you use a health survey uh, or uh, 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 digital me medical records. Uh, so you, you must be familiar with those tablet data. And machine learning is probably best suited for those type of data. Uh, and why is shadow learning? Because it's, it has only one layer, uh, basically a, a, a single layer of weights uh, that are learnable uh, to build a model upon. And uh, the deep learning as the counterpart of machine learning. Uh, so the deep really come from uh, many layers of artificial neural network. So that is where uh, the term uh, deep come from. Uh, and here, uh, so the, the deep learning are really best suited for learning more complicated and untraditional so-called big data. For example, images, videos, audios, text, speech, right? Uh, so those data are often unstructured or, or semi-structured, and those data usually represent a more complicated relationship that are hard can be hard for a shallow learning algorithm to 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 learn. Uh, uh, so therefore, you know, we we often have a, a demand uh, to use deep learning. And here, this figure shows the deep learning. So basically, we 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 have an input, right? Maybe the input would be you no know, a, a batch of images, you know, some videos or or, or you no know, uh, audios or uh, natural languages, you no know, uh, paragraphs or, or, or articles. So you consider those uh, as the input to the uh, the input layer. Uh, L1, and then you will see that the purple dots uh, denote the, the hidden layer. Uh, we can have really arbitrary number of hidden layers, and the more hidden layers you have, the more complicated the model is going to be, and the more difficult and complex relationship this model are going to present. Right? Um, and then you will see that you know, those input uh, layers are 
uh, are, are densely correlated with those hidden layers, right? Uh, and then, well, uh, then the, the final output uh, on the right hand side are the uh, represented by the red dots uh, denoting the output layer, right? So basically, it's going to, uh, so in a nutshell, uh, deep learning is just trying to match uh, the, the inputs. Uh, to some kind of outputs. Maybe the inputs are images and outputs are labels, for example, whether an image is a cat or a dog, or maybe the, the inputs are Wikipedia uh, files uh, and the outputs would be um, some, some, uh, some, out, so, so, some uh, classification of the topic uh, or maybe uh, creating like a new paragraph you know, about something. Uh, but so, so basically, uh, the deep learning is just a match between the inputs and outputs, but the middle can be arbitrarily complicated, right? Using more layers, using more neurons in the layers, uh, so that the model can really incorporate uh, arbitrarily complicated relationships. And uh, in terms of uh, no different type of AI systems, we uh, usually we can classify them into three types: unsupervised learning, so learning by data only. So basically, for example, we only provide dog and cat images, but we do not label them. So the machine are not going to tell whether an image is a, a dog or a cat, and the machine is going to learn some, for example, clustering patterns. Try right, to cluster maybe dogs together and cats together. So that is called unsupervised learning, learning by data only. And supervised learning is really learning by examples. Examples means we provide both data as well as labels to the machine. So that machine may be, for example, classify them, right? So we provide not only the dog and the cat image, but also there's column function labels. So we tell which, which image is a dog, which image is a cat, and the machine is gonna learn the relationship between the image and the label and try to come up with the rule. And finally, we also have the reinforcement learning. So learning by incentives. Uh, so for example, how you can really learn, tell a machine to, you know, uh, to put out a fire you know, when, it's, when it sees it. Uh, and, and then, um, uh, but not directly approaching, approaching fire to get burned, right? How can you teach a machine to do that? Well, the baby can do that. And how baby learn that? Because, well, every time if the baby is approaching fire, the baby get punished. Uh, and if the baby every time, you no, know, say maybe grab some water to put out a fire, you give uh, the baby maybe some milk, right? And, and we do the same for machines. Uh, when machine is doing this, uh, when a machine um, automated agent is trying to approach the fire directly, we give a negative incentive. Basically, we reduce maybe 10 points. Uh, for the machine. And when the machine is doing the right way, you no know, trying to put out the fire with uh, water, we give the machine positive incentive, maybe a hundred um, uh, 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 you know, a point of incentive. And the goal of the machine is just to maximize the incentive, right? And that's enough for machine to learn over time uh, uh, how uh, it should uh, respond uh, when it sees a fire. And AI models, well, uh, you know, we, we are see really uh, the landscaping is changing dramatically. Uh, we consider we are building really uh, more and more powerful models with more and more parameters, right? If you learn about a, a regression analysis, probably you'll be uh, building a large model means you have maybe 50, 100 features, right? <laughs> Weights, right? But in machine learning, well, uh, for example, the language models, uh, the language models are uh, in, um, in the early days, early days is not 10 years ago. Uh, so uh, the, the Google built uh, the, the, the language models that have uh, you no know, 12 million parameters, right? Is uh, Albert, uh, they all use this very uh, funny name of uh, Sesame Street characters to name those uh, language models. So there's Bird and Big Bird and Rob, Robert and all that, right? Uh, and you see that you no, know, uh, over time uh, we are building larger and larger models. For example, the state-of-the-art language model built by OpenAI uh, GPT-3 now has a daunting uh, number of 175 billion parameters, right? That is how large the model is. Uh, it's almost approaching the number of neurons in our brain, right? Uh, so of course those models would have superhuman, uh, a, a lot of uh, near human or sometimes even superhuman performances in understanding natural languages. 
Uh, and well, if we talk about the AI, the application of AI in health and social sciences, there is really a, a really a emerging domain, but many, many applications. Of course, this list is just uh, a tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, for example, it has been applied to analyze CT scan and MRI imaging, try to, uh, to identify tumors right, uh, from uh, affected organs uh, no, uh, from the CT scan or MRI images. Uh, no, we, we, uh, the, the uh, uh, AI has been applied to extensively to patient healthcare. So recently, uh, you know, some of you, if you were uh, in Washington before and listened to a presentation, uh, th there was some a German-based companies that built an AI autom automated machine that can transfer patients uh, from, different, uh, uh, from, from, uh, from different places in, in the, carry uh, patients into different places in, in the hospital, right? Um, and AI has been used to predict the disease onset, for example, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, fall, right? Uh, and AI has been widely used in sentiment and trend analysis using social media data, right? No, uh, because we are producing definitely more data than we can ever analyze, right? Uh, no, consider the number of uh, tweeters, uh, tweets, uh, the, the number of uh, social uh, posting uh, in, in Facebook and other uh, social media. And um, uh, the AI has been used to track the trend uh, and try to create uh, on time, uh, really, uh, uh, real time uh, uh, monitoring of the sentiment, for example, uh, people's emotion about uh, COVID 19 pandemic, right? Uh, and uh, AI has been used in theme and topic identification and synthesization. For example, you no, know, there were applications using topic modeling uh, to look at you know, 100 years of New York Times publications, right? Consider the, the sheer volume and that, that human would, would know, we would easily spend you know, a few thousand years to, to, uh, to, to analyze the you know, 100 years of New York Times publications. Uh, uh, and not to see to classify them and to summarize them, right? Uh, but machine learning can do that. Um, and uh, well, there's a really increasing demand of, uh, of uh, both companion and therapeutic chatbots. So I don't know whether many of you have used that. Uh, it has been really uh, on the rise. Uh, so we, we, nowadays uh, the therapeutic chatbot can to some extent uh, help people diagnose uh, and treat uh, mental illnesses. Uh, and uh, no many uh, especially young generation are increasingly in, uh, interacting with uh, companion chatbots, uh, uh, the replica and, and many others uh, uh, to, to, uh, on a daily basis, right? Asking them questions, maybe or just, just for you know, general chatting. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of uh, like common uh, misperceptions uh, about AI, right? Uh, because you no know, AI uh, to many people is just a buzzword. To others, is is really uh, something evil <laughs> or something need to be uh, to be cautioned of. Uh, so and, and and to learners, right? And for example, especially for our graduate students. Uh, and, and we, we, we hear about the medical application of AI, but uh, there, there are still a lot of misperceptions that prevent people from, uh, from becoming a, uh, a AI, uh, a person interested in AI to a person that's learning and applying AI, right? And believe it or not, the real hurdle that I've seen is not uh, uh, the lack of uh, uh, skill set or the lack of talent or the lack of uh, uh, motivation to learn AI. Um, on the contrary, it's really a lot of those uh, uh, misperceptions about AI that prevent people from learning more, from actively engage in and serious consider uh, in, in learning AI uh, and acquiring those, uh, those technologies. And here I summarized a few major uh, misperceptions that prevent people from engaging in AI learning. One common uh, misperception is AI is too much math and statistics, right? I'm, I'm a social scientist. No, I don't want to mess up with, with math, right? It's not my, not my food, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not my taste. Um, 
And uh, I really don't want to look at those mathematical equations, right? Uh, and the second misperception is too much programming, right? No, again, uh, uh, I, I, I'm a social scientist. I, I'm, I know, I'm working with people, not working with computer. Uh, so uh, that computer scientist mess up with programming, and I don't want to touch coding. Right. Uh, another misperception is, well, AI is just need too much data, right? No, where, you no, know, as I'm a social scientist, where should I, you know, how can I collect this so much data to feed into the AI algorithm, right? So you already know AI, you know, probably need maybe 10 million observations. <laughs> how could I get those 10 million observations, right? Um, so therefore, AI is distant to me. Uh, you no, know, I, I have no resource uh, and I have no application for AI. Another misperception is AI is expensive, right? Uh, AI often require a GPU powered computer, which is uh, out of my budget. No, I just do not have the computational resources to do any of those complicated modeling, right? Uh, and another misperception is no, no, even if I learn AI, even if I become a practitioner, I still cannot compete with professional AI scientists on the job market, no matter how much I learn. Right, because they are professional. I'm just uh, no uh, nobody. Uh, so uh, no. Uh, so why should I learn something and then still feel not being com uh, 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 competitive enough on the job market? Right. So those are the misperceptions that I've often seen. Um, so let's talk to talk them one by one. The first one. Uh, too much math and statistic. Uh, the answer, short answer is yes. Uh, the AI definitely involves a lot of math and statistics and engineering. Uh, but really, for most AI practitioners, you do need to know the math and statistic behind the algorithm. Okay? You won't have to become a mathematician or statistician to become a good AI practitioner. Right? I would say 99% of AI practitioners do not uh, really uh, learn the, the, the mathematical equations and, and try to derive the formula or you know, approve the algorithms because it's not needed. Uh, it's not your job, it's not your concern. Your, 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 you are really on the application side. It's just like you, you learn regression, you won't have to prove you know, every single algorithm, like central uh, theorem, to be able to apply regression, right? Uh, and then, uh, so uh, for AI practitioners, the intuitions and experiences are definitely you no know, tenfold more, more important uh, uh, than the math behind. For example, it's vitally important for understand the bias variance trade-off uh, in, in, in emotion learning. But that is not to say you have to mathematically prove that uh, the, uh, the, the total model variance equals bias plus variance plus irreducible error term, right? <laughs> and, uh, so modern AI is more engineering than math proofs uh, because actually uh, for most of the AI algorithms, uh, they are developed not actually from the statistical theorem or mathematical theorem, but it really come from the trial and error, right? It's much like engineering. You try this, this works, and really you don't know why this works, but it works. And that's the most important. Um, and then uh, second, no too much, uh, uh, too too much programming, right? So AI programming has been increasingly become increasingly simpler thanks to Python, which is a high level programming language, and high level APIs. There are many high level APIs that really make your programming much much easier. Uh, and nowadays, probably you you've heard of no code uh, programming, right? There's a language model based on GPT three that allow you to do uh, to create softwares or apps without understanding anything about, uh, about, uh, about programming, because you just need to describe what you want to do. And the machine and the models are going to come up with the code to do the work you ask it to do. Okay? Amazing, right? Uh, but well, uh, in general, we are not at the stage yet, but we, we see the trend. We, we need less and less programming because of the high level APIs. For example, here, no, um, uh, you, you see there's two, the, the, two, the first two lines of code, right? The random forest regressor and, and RF FET, right? Those two lines of code is going to run a, a state-of-the-art random forest regression for you, okay? Easy enough, right? 
And now you will see that the, the, the second few lines of code, right? But actually they are just a three line because I, I, I put them in, into different lines to, to make it look easier, but it's it just uh, three lines. The first line is creating a sequential model. Uh, and the second is compare the model. And the third is fit model. That is all you need to create a neural network model, right? A deep learning model, uh, three line of code, right? No, uh, is this difficult? Well, of course there's a learning curve. But it, I will say no to most of us, no, even social scientists, no, it's the barrier is not probably as large as you imagine. And uh, no, another argument is need too much data become useful, right? So this is where the transfer learning can help. Uh, so transfer learning is really nowadays the standard application of AI because it allow you to stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, because there are so many models that have already been developed. Uh, you no, know, for example, computer vision models based on you no know, 40 million images classified into you know, a few hundred categories, uh, and the language models that were built based on the whole Wikipedia text. Right? Uh, think about the, how how many uh, you no know, uh, you no know, what a spatial model occupy. Right. Uh, so uh, it means that, well, if you build a new model, you are not going to start from scratch. 99% of the time, you are not start from scratch, but you build upon those giant mighty model with billions of parameters, right? And just you need to tweak a little bit to achieve state-of-the-art performance using a much, much smaller sample size, maybe uh, tens, maybe in the hundreds, uh, no, mostly no, a few thousand, right? Uh, and and uh, so here I show you an example, a GPT-2 model prediction, right? So I wrote the first sentence, first part of the sentence, and I do not do any training. So uh, here I do not provide a, even a single example for the machine to learn. I just use the model uh, to do a prediction right? and see how, how good the model is already is. I wrote, Life is like a box of chocolates, right? The, the very famous saying uh, uh, from, from Hank's movie, right? Uh, uh, first game movie. And, and uh, look at the second part. So the, 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 the blue part was actually predicted by, uh, by the GPT-2 model. It opens into itself. It fills it with life. And it's all about sharing. Wow, this is amazing, right? I can't really write something like that. Uh, uh, it's very artistic, right? Uh, so if I tell you this was written by a machine, would you believe it? And if I tell you the machine is not even trained uh, on, on the data, uh, on, on new data, it's just to make a so-called zero-shot learning, basically no data provided at all. Would you believe that? Right? Uh, and then no, some may concern about the computation resources too expensive, right? But good news, you don't need to purchase a GPU-powered computer. I don't have a GPU-powered computer. Uh, you can use a lot of free resources. For example, Google Lab link provided and Kaggle link provided often offer free GPU computing to some extent. I think if you want to use more GPU, yes, you can also purchase them, but very affordable rate, you know, a few bucks a year, you know, up to, of course, you no. Know, if you want to do really state of art modeling, you probably need to pay more. But bottom line is you can use whatever junk computer you have. Right? Uh, now look at the photos here. You can use your uh, your iPad. You can use a you no know, uh, a, a ten year old computer. It doesn't matter as long as the computer can access the internet. Then you can access the cloud computing resources, and then you can use them, uh, and, and with a very low rate. Okay. Um, so therefore, now, nowadays I don't even need my personal computer. No, my, my computer uh, are not advanced at all. Uh, and I can use any computer. I can use my iPad uh, uh, to, to, to do the computation as long as I can access the cloud uh, computing platform. Uh, and well, another uh, no, uh, obstacle, another misperception is you can't compete with professional AI scientists. Yes, you, you can't, right? Because they are professional, they are trained to do AI modeling, but you may never need to. You may never need to because well, the job market really value people with interdisciplinary background. For example, if you're a public health practitioner, if you're a social worker, but you are also a data scientist, those are the most rewarding combination in, in the job market. Um, and you are not competing with, uh, with statisticians. You are not competing with AI uh, uh, engineer, right? Uh, uh, so 
you are competing still in your own domain. You are competing with other public health practitioners, competing with other social workers, uh, uh, and, and you you are probably the, uh, the, the 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 public health practitioner, social worker that know the most about data science, and that is your uh, competitive advantage. So, you no, know, have you ever seen an AI expert competing for a public health job? I have never seen that, right? Nor you, you are going to apply for an engineering job, right? Uh, so, you no, know, we are still in our own domain of expertise, but we just bring additional edge, uh, borrowing from data science to our own domain, right? To make us, uh, you know, us more competitive on the job market. Uh, and then, well, if you want to ask me, you know, uh, if I hopefully convince you enough, you can and you should learn AI. And where do you start, right? Although I have uh, you know, uh, two courses offered, uh, three courses actually offered at WashU. One is applied machine learning using health data. I offer it every spring. And applied deep learning using health data, we offer every fall starting from next semester. I'm going to offer this for the first time. And also we have a post-master certificate program. Right? So if you already acquired your master's degree and you want to learn more uh, about AI and get a WashU certificate, and then you are more than welcome to, to, uh, to participate in this artificial intelligence applications for health data. It is a post-master certificate program offered starting from this fall. Uh, and I provide the link here in case you are interested in you know, uh, register. Uh, so we are going to really mess up uh, with the, uh, the AI programs uh, and try to test you know, many models and applications uh, on health and social, uh, uh, social science data. Uh, and well, we are, we are later on uh, in fall 2023, we are going to roll out our AI certificate program. So this certificate program is different from post-master uh, degree program. The post-master program is only for, is only a three credit, uh, a full course, but the AI certificate program for our master and PhD students uh, consists of two uh, courses and also two skill labs. Uh, so, you know, uh, we are going to roll this out in, in, in fall 2020, uh, in, uh, actually in, in fall 2023, you know, if you are interested in, uh, uh, in, in doing that. And uh, so I also provided a few resources uh, for to learn, for example, Scikit-learn is a great Python library for doing machine learning. Uh, NumPy is great for data manipulation together with Pandas. Uh, and then Matplotlib is great for data visualization. And Jupyter Net, uh, Notebook and Google Colab are great if you want to really learn about uh, apply Python programming. Those are the excellent uh, platform for you to, to write the programs. And there are two recommended textbooks, uh, one on machine learning and one on deep learning. Uh, the, I know there are no hundreds of different textbooks and most of them are junk. Uh, so those two textbooks are really the best uh, of its kind. Uh, so I would highly recommend. Okay, so uh, that's all I want to talk about. Um, and I'm open to questions. Any questions in the comments, uh, uh, feel free to raise them. So feel free to either post your questions on the chat or you know, just unmute yourself and ask a question. And I saw that Zizi uh, uh, posted the, uh, the AI Postmaster Certificate Program. Yes, definitely take a look if you're interested in that. Uh, uh, so no, the, 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 uh, the certificate program is developed for, uh, for those who are interested in AI, but uh, have never applied AI, nor have any programming skills. So really, we're going to start from, from, from the basic Python programming, moving all the way to complicated deep learning models. Any question, comments? Well, I just had a comment. Um, very, very interesting. Thank you so much for the talk. And I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so this certificate, do you have to like have finished the master's to get it? Uh, 
So for majority of the working professionals, I, I think the answer is yes, uh, but there could be some uh, exceptions. So basically, you no. Know, for example, if you are approaching the end of your master program, uh, but the still not get the uh, the the, the that it completed, uh, you can ask for uh, a, a an exception. Uh, uh, so we have the contact there in, in the bronze in, in the uh, in the contact. Uh, the bronze will contact, and you can consult with them. Uh, I think they have some procedures uh, to make that happen. Uh, no, if you are approaching the end of your master's program. Okay. Great question. Any other questions, comments? Brianna, uh, Zizi, you have any 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 comments uh, or anything we want to share with our you know, really uh, brilliant audience? I have a question. So I heard that like Washer has been, you know, really encouraged like interdisciplinary learning and also encourage students to take courses, not just in the Brown School. So do you also teach this course at other schools under Washu? Is there any opportunity to learn it with students? Maybe their major is engineering or computer science or anything. Right, this is a great question. Uh, so we do see quite actually for, for this uh, this semester, I'm teaching the machine learning course and I do see you know, uh, a few students from medical school coming to take uh, my course. And actually probably uh, two students from other universities as well. Uh, so based on the university arrangement, they, they, they can take my course. Uh, but really the course is mainly for you no know, uh, health and social scientists. Uh, really not not for engineering students because for engineering students they, they probably learn this from a different domain right they need to learn about uh, the the algorithm itself because their role is not to primarily use the application but to develop new algorithms right so uh, the, the the angle will be quite different uh, but really for uh, you no know, health and social sciences in general for example students in uh, in political science maybe uh, in uh, in nutritional science, uh, in social work, public health, medicine, um, and you know, so anthropology. So we, we do see a, a, a interest in that, but we actually you know uh, my course, the applied machine learning is, uh, is really capped. So we, we increased the cap two times. First, we only admitted 15 students, but the, uh, the course was filled within the first hour. And then we increased that to 25 and it's filled within two hours. And finally, we, we, we increased to 30, but we just can't increase the capacity anymore because we can only accommodate so many students. So we do see a huge demand from over the campus uh, on those new courses, uh, especially you know, how we, our angle of doing applied machine learning. We are not really learning mathematics. Or we are not really to, to do any proof, but we really, we are trying to know, know how I can learn about enough programming and enough modeling so that I can apply those AI technologies to the, the, the real world questions I care about and be interested in. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, uh, we have one minute uh, before we hit the clock. Any final thoughts and questions? Okay, you are most welcome. Uh, okay, so if we not further questions, uh, we, uh, we, we, we will hop off and really nice meeting you all. And I wish you know, to see many of you in my courses. Uh, and if not, definitely on Washu campus, uh, which is, you know, we have beautiful spring here and after the pandemic, you know, uh, we really want to see you know, all of you, uh, not only virtually, but also physically. Okay, so thank you so much. And, and especially thanks to, to Zizi and Brianna uh, you know, for, for hosting this. And thank you the, our audience uh, for your patience and your interest. And I wish all of you a great rest of the week. Bye everyone.